see you all here. As we uh, worship together, we are in the middle of a series where we're talking about those practices of our faith. We recognize that of the many things that Jesus asked us to do, uh, we often study them, memorize them, we talk about them, we hear them preached, but in terms of how to actually live that out, we often leave that to Sunday morning. <laughs> and so what we're doing in this series is finding out, now when we hear what Jesus says, how do we live that out? How do we put that into practice in our daily lives? And so in the last few weeks, we've covered a number of different aspects. We've talked about how do we practice the way of nonviolence that Jesus talked about, where you know, he said if someone smacks you on one cheek, you know, turn and give them the other. How do we live that out? We've talked about prayer. We've talked about forgiveness. We've talked about providing service to others. All of these things that Jesus has instructed believers to do, and we've been learning some aspects, some practice that we can actually put into place in our lives. Today is no different. We're going to be talking about fasting. And uh, when we talk about fasting, many different ideas come to mind. I, I know that for me, I think, ooh, no food, what does that mean? <laughs> it's not something I enjoy. I uh, remember having a conversation with someone about fasting, and this was during the season of Lent. And they're saying, I'm looking for uh, some food that I'm going to give up for the entire season of Lent. And uh, he said that he was going to give up ranch dressing. I said, I don't know if I understand why that's such a sacrifice for you. He says, well, you know, I live here in the South, and we have all our food deep fried and breaded and generally covered in cheese, but sometimes I like to dip it into the ranch dressing, and I'm going to give up the ranch dressing instead of the other pieces. I thought, that's, that's sacrifice, right there. <laughs> but fasting is not just about giving up food. It is the practice of willingly giving up something that you need or you want for a period of time so that you can attune your heart and your mind to the things of God. It's purposefully setting aside things that you might need or want so that you might be able to focus on God's will and the things of God in your life. Now as we were reading in the very first scripture reading of Isaiah, we recognize that there are times when people have participated in a fast but it hasn't changed their heart. It hasn't changed their lifestyle. It hasn't changed anything about them. And that's not what God is desiring. We don't fast in order to try to get something from God or to somehow look good in front of others. And so as I was thinking through this whole concept of fasting, I recognized that there are a few key uh, word phrases that might help us to, to put this out there. And one is that it's not just a bad diet. And uh, some, we've got all kinds of fad diets that are out there. You know, there was a while where it said, uh, only eat grapefruits, right? That was a good way to lose weight. And I like the diet that said, you can eat bacon and, deep, uh, and uh, meat burgers all you want, just don't eat the buns. I said, that's, a, that's a diet for me. I can live that out. But the thing is, uh, fasting is not just a fad diet. Jesus says to his disciples, he says, when you fast, don't do it for show. Don't do it in a way that other people are going to know. Because it's not just about trying to look good for others. You know, some people fast, they you know, keep away from diets in order that they could look good on the outside, right? But what the idea is that we're not trying to just look on, on the outside, but we're really focusing on what's on the inside. And this is where Jesus says, For God knows what is done in secret. Meaning, God knows the desires of our heart. God knows what is happening within our soul, our spirit. And so as we fast, keeping in mind that we're not just doing something outwardly, but there's actually supposed to be something that happens inwardly. I remember with youth group, we had this 30-hour famine that we did. And uh, during those 30 hours, you know, we stayed together in the church and we did some fun activities. But I know for me, I spent the entire time thinking about the food that I wasn't eating. <laughs> And, you know, by the, by the time that it was over, I was just so glad that we had food that I'd forgotten everything else that happened during that 30 hours. The focus of fasting isn't just to not eat, but it's to put something in that place that is supposed to be building of the soul, the building of our lives, to be focusing our mind on God. During a time where I was preparing for missionary service, I decided that I would skip lunch on Wednesdays. That was a very specific type of fast. And during that time, I said, during that time, I'm going to actually pray. So instead of just giving up lunch, I was actually focusing my mind on praying. 
I think that's the type of fast that God's looking for. It's not just something that is shown outwardly so that other people can say, oh, you're, you're fasting. But there's supposed to be something inwardly that's happening within you. To say, I'm desiring God more than the things of the world. In a way, it's a kind of physical training that's happening. It's a training of weaning ourselves off of the physical stuff that we feel that we need so that our spirits might be strengthened in order to be attuned to God. It is a kind of training, a regimen that you might be a part of, where you're, you're purposefully letting go of one habit so that you might practice and learn of another habit. And so in spiritual terms, we're saying we're giving up just uh, stuffing our faces so that we might practice stuffing our soul. How do we learn that practice? It isn't something that we can just maybe do overnight, you know, fast a week without food. Well, that's, that's, not, that's not smart. <laughs> just don't do that. But with simple, small practices. Like I was mentioning, with all of these practices we're talking about, whether it's prayer or forgiveness, taking a small bite, uh, a small piece of what that would be, so we can try that out, is primarily the main point of this. To try it out. Try something small. And so, you know, one, one meal, one thing. Maybe it's just the ranch dressing. But something to uh, say, you know, instead of having the ranch dressing, every time I might want to dip my deep fried chicken nuggets in the ranch dressing, I might say, you know, a little prayer. Or whatever that is. But finding some simple way in which that activity is now being transferred into a little bit of a training for one's soul. So he says, you know, it's not an outward sign. It's not just a trendy diet. It's not, uh, we recognize that we are not storing uh, for ourselves uh, to look good for others, but we realize that God rewards those who seek them. God rewards those who seek Him, that is. Now, as we trust God and recognize that God rewards those who seek Him, we realize that the reward is very similar to what we might think of the benefits of food or the things we might be practicing in our lives that are different than fasting. You know, we, we think of, well, this food has certain nutrients, it has uh, certain energy qualities, maybe it has carbohydrates or something, and that's going to benefit me later on in my life. It's, it's food, it's energy for my life. Well, in the same way, we recognize we turn to God that we might receive from God the energy for our soul. We might receive from God the, the storage of the good things that He is wanting to provide for us. Fasting has a way of slowing us down in our, our process of life. We're very busy about a number of different things. But if we recognize that we're going to set time aside from the things that we might normally be doing, you can actually fast from watching TV. You can fast from the Internet. You can fast from Facebook. You can fast from uh, spending time on the phone with friends. You can fast from a number of things so that you can tune your mind into where God is in your life. And that setting aside time helps us to recognize where God is. God does desire to give to His people good things. But often we're so busy with this other stuff that we miss out on what God actually desires to provide for us. And the scripture would tell us that we recognize that God does desire to give us good things. And as we trust Him, we can receive from Him what His good pleasure and will is for us. And as we trust in that, we can receive that. Now, the second thing I want us to uh, keep in mind is that you are what you eat. Now, some of us say, yes, I recognize that <laughs> very clearly. But uh, we are what we eat. All the various things, it's very real uh, truth that you know, if you eat junk food, eventually your cells get uh, enticed with all the, the bad stuff. But if you eat good stuff, you eat the nutritious stuff, your cells go, yes, thank you. And they're actually uh, absorbing the nutrients and the minerals and the, the essential ingredients of those things you eat become part of your body. It's pretty amazing the way that works out. Spiritually speaking, the same thing is true. That we are to, supposed to enjoy and engage in those spiritual practices that become part of our spiritual life. So there's a difference between eating spiritual junk food and spiritual healthy food. And so recognizing what that is. And so looking at what it is that is good for our soul, Jesus talks about it in this terms. He says, we should not store our treasures here on earth. We can spend a lot of time in our spirit desiring after the things that are here on this earth. Focusing our time and our energies and our passions. Simply trying to gather around us all the things we feel we need. And that can absorb all of our time and our energies. But at the end of that, the result of it is going to be that we will 
demonstrate to the world what the world is. It will become manifested in our lives. We absorb the things of the world, you know, those uh, inputs from the internet or the TV or whatever else, those become a part of our spiritual nature, so those become exhibited in the world. That's the spiritual junk food. <laughs> but if we're wanting to grow spiritually, we recognize we have to spend some time on a spiritual diet. A diet that is focused on where God is and what God would desire for us. And as we glean and spend time being nourished by that, that was the Psalm 1 that we read today. It is like a tree whose roots are planted by streams of water. They receive the nutrients from God so that the tree itself bears fruit in its season. Its leaves do not wither. There's a truth to that, that the spiritual truths become evident in our life. And in the same way that we meditate on the scripture, we begin to live that out in a way that our words and our actions and our thoughts and our attitudes begin to reflect God. And so fasting, in this terms of mind, is to fast from the junk food of the world and to not store up for ourselves treasures on earth, but rather to find ways of storing up the things of God. To store in our soul, to store up in heaven the things that God would desire for us. And he uh, puts this in the quality phrase. It says, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. So when we look at the results, we look at what we are exhibiting, we look at where is our treasure, where is it we're uh, stockpiling our stuff, we recognize that our heart reflects that. If our heart is reflected in our stuff, what is, it, what is that showing? What is it saying about us? And so storing up for ourselves treasures in heaven is the result of spending time with being nurtured and saturated in God through his word, through times of prayer. And fasting provides a way of focusing what that is in our lives. Again, fasting is not trying to get stuff from God, but rather it's a way of helping us to attune our hearts and our minds to where God is. The third thing I want to say about this is that it is true that garbage in provides garbage out. And that, uh, as Jesus talks about it, he says, the eyes are the lamp of the body. And really, I think that I was researching what that means for the eyes to be the lamp of the body. Think about a flashlight. Think about you're in a dark room and you turn on a flashlight. That flashlight helps you to know where you're going. And so what Jesus is saying is that our eyes, and he's not just talking about our physical eyes, but he's talking about our focus of life, gives the direction for where our feet will travel. If our feet and our mind is focused on the things of this earth and are focused on the things that we might desire, it says that we become unhealthy. What does it mean for the eye to be unhealthy or to be healthy? In the Greek words for health, you're actually describing if your eyes are generous or if you are being uh, ungenerous, essentially. Those two are the contrasts. And what he's describing here is the Jewish concept of the evil eye. And this is what we see in the Ten Commandments. It says, do not uh, look to your neighbor with the covetous of the heart to desire what he has. Whether it be his possessions, his belongings, his donkey, his whatever. That is the evil eye. In which you are looking to others to get stuff for yourself. That is the darkness that he's describing about. The garbage in and the garbage out. But rather, he's describing that instead of having this eye of covetousness, what is being described as healthy is an eye that is looking for generosity. An eye that says, instead of, where can I take something from someone else, but rather, how is it that I might be as a provision for others? And that as we look to where God is enabling us to provide service to others, we see that as being the light for our soul. We see that as a, a way of transforming our mindset from being a mindset stuck on what we need and what we desire for ourselves to being one of serving God. And in this way, Jesus puts it this way, you cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve both money and God. You cannot serve mammon and things of God. And he talks about it in two ways. He talks about first as devotion. Because you could either be devoted to one, to, devoted to one or despise the other. And as I think about the word devotion, I think about attitudes. I think about heart desires. You know, our devotion. I, I remember when I was first uh, dating my wife, I, I would say I was devoted to her in some way because my mind, my heart, continued to wrap itself around her in the sense of how, what sort of things can I do that would be good for her? How can I see her again? You know, all these different things became a part of the passions of my heart, the devotion. 
we recognize we cannot be devoted to both money and to God. If our heart is set on how do we acquire things for ourselves, how do we look around and think, oh, that's a really nice car, I wish I had that, or that's a really nice house, I wish I had that, or that's a nice computer, or there's a new thing on, on the TV that says, I need to have this. If our heart is focused on all those things that we don't have, that we need more of, then we recognize that our devotional thoughts, our minds, our attitudes are on the things of this earth. God would have us to transform that to having a devotion that is asking the question, what is it that God would want for us? Where is it that God is at work in the world? A heart that says, Lord, I am devoted to where you are. I'm interested to knowing your mind, your thoughts, your desires for me, my life. I know that with many of us, as we first came into relationship with Christ, we first uh, knew of his salvation for us, perhaps there was something that happened in your soul where you said, yes, Lord, I want more of this. I'd, I'd rather spend time with God alone than to, to be out there in the world. I, I want to know God more. There's a story about a man who was at a restaurant. And as he was there at the restaurant, he'd been waiting for uh, this girl to come and spend time with him. And the waiter came over after about 45 minutes and said, Sir, uh, I know you're waiting for somebody. Uh, can I get you anything? And he says, Well, just uh, another cup of coffee as I'm waiting here. And the uh, waiter got him another cup of coffee, and an hour and a half went by, and the man finally stood up, and the waiter says, so, I guess she's not coming. And he says, no, but I'll be here again tomorrow night. Apparently, that man had been there every night for a couple of months, and the waiter started getting curious as he kept coming night after night, and said, this person you're waiting for, uh, are you sure they're coming? He says, yes, I know they'll be here, I know that they need me. He says, why, why do you keep coming with, with that person not showing up? And the man says, because I love her. Because of my love. Now the, the description of that is of how God waits for us. How every night, every day, God is waiting for the opportunity for us to come to Him. But so often, we get busy with other things. We say, oh, I know God will understand God will forgive me. I've got other things to do today. It was better for me to spend time with my friends or for me to go out and, and do these various things than to spend time with God. But then, God is still waiting, anxiously anticipating the time in which we might turn our minds from the things of the world and say, Lord, I want to know you. As we think about fasting, you know, what might be a practical way we could live that out? You might think for yourself, it is maybe that ranch dressing that you could give up this week. But I want you to consider not just what you might be giving up. We talked about it being an attitude of the heart, of a transformation, of moving our mind from the things of the world to the things of God. Is there some time that you can purposefully take away from the things you're already engaged in, whether it be a time of eating, time of engaging in a telephone conversation or a Skype phone call or, or something like that, we say, this is going to be time this week that I'm going to not do something that I might even need, that I might be able to carve out that time to be alone with God, so that I might come to know God and that I might devote myself to God and to know of God's will for me. We cannot serve both the world and God. In the practice of fasting, we purposefully are setting aside some aspect of our life so that we can tune our minds in and train our souls to know something of God. I invite us to sing as we sing a song of response, Come and find a quiet center. This is a way of our hearts responding to discover how it is.